Jeremy is not excited about the prospect of spending the summer with his dad and uncle in a seaside cabin in Oregon. It's the first summer after his parents' divorce, and he hasn't exactly been seeking alone time with his dad. He doesn't have a choice, though, so he goes. On his first day, he takes a walk on the beach and finds himself intrigued by a boy his age running by. Just like that, his summer changes. On a trip into town, he meets Runner Boy again and discovers he has a name, Evan, and a presence Jeremy finds irresistible. Soon, Jeremy and Evan are hanging out whenever they can, going on adventures and conjuring their own secret language. What starts out as friendship blooms into something neither boy is expecting something both Jeremy and Evan have been hoping for. Separate, they have questions and worries. Together, they take wing. This is a preview of The Language of Seabirds by Will Taylor. They say living through an Oregon winter is the closest most people there ever come to drowning. As autumn dies, a ceiling of gravestone cloud settles over the land, pressing heavier week after dreary week. Sooner or later, everyone under that sky feels the pressure, the creeping sense of being trapped. For Jeremy Ryden, it arrived over breakfast on the first day of winter break which also happened to be his first day of being 12. It was Uncle Becker's birthday card that sparked it, the shiny picture of a lifeguard girl on a tropical beach sliding out of the envelope like a bad joke told too loud. Jeremy's mom looked up from her phone long enough to frown, but his dad whistled and laughed, clapping him on the back. So Jeremy, panicking, pretended to like the picture, forcing a smile and counting down the seconds while pressure built over his heart. As soon as he dared, he extracted his $20 bill and flipped the card over, relieved to find a sweep of empty sand and waves and electric blue sky decorating the back. He stared for real this time, then caught himself and yanked his gaze away landing instead on the steady drizzle filling their small kitchen window. And just like that, the weight of the Oregon winter hit home, filling his lungs. He felt his dad's eyes on him and turned back to the picture with its beach and sky and impossible freedom, a question jumping to his lips. Why haven't we ever been to the ocean? His dad choked on his bacon, and his mom set down her coffee with an offended clack. In a moment of rare agreement, they both insisted he certainly had been to the ocean, naming a summer when the three of them had trooped the 90 miles west from Corvallis to the coast. From what they reported, Jeremy hadn't even reached kindergarten at the time, and he could say truthfully that he didn't remember. His mom retrieved the family photo album for evidence, but when no one was able to find any pictures, suddenly the exact year was up for debate. Apparently knowing the exact year of things was important in a marriage, and it wasn't long before Jeremy was slipping back to his room, leaving his parents bickering over the remains of his birthday breakfast. The gray December rain pattered sullenly against his window, doing nothing to cover the sound of his parents' increasingly loud disagreement as Jeremy flopped onto his bed. He had woken that morning tight with nerves, thinking this of all days might be the day to let his parents in on what he had recently realized about himself, that when it came to love and romance, his feelings were aimed at other guys. He had hoped to get the telling over and done with, with his mom on hand in case the news disappointed his dad. But that wasn't going to happen now. 
Winter surrounded the house, and the house surrounded his room, and Jeremy curled up alone in the middle of it, turning to his hidden stash of fashion magazines for company. Gratefully, he sank into the unchanging glamour of their glossy pages, holding all his secrets in, wondering when he would ever find the words and the courage to let them out. Six months later, in the clean sunlight of late June, Jeremy rolled down the passenger window of his dad's car and looked out over the Pacific. It was just the two of them now, one half of the divided family that Jeremy was somehow expected to learn to bridge. Remember it, Jer? His dad asked, breaking 50 miles of silence. Jeremy, his eyes full of white-capped rolling blue, shook his head. His dad made a sound through his nose, the short dismissive grunt that had become part of his regular vocabulary that spring as the divorce ground its way to completion. Jeremy leaned against his seatbelt strap, listening to the wind whiffle past. He wondered if some part of him actually did remember this, if some recognition left over from childhood was why shivers were tapping along his shoulders, why deep down he almost felt like crying. The road dropped at the next turn, hiding the heaving ocean and sending them past houses with pinstriped lawns, trailer parks with plastic flowers, and small churches with giant signs. Finally, a painted driftwood log announced they had reached Rosemont. Jeremy read out the directions Uncle Becker had sent, and five minutes later they were pulling up alongside a red pickup in the gravel driveway of the house that would be their home for the next two weeks. The house was on the beach, or as close to the beach as a house could get, set back from the sand on a shelf of earth flecked with pine cones from the two wind-bent trees standing over it. It was a small house, painted brown, with a ground floor, a gabled attic, and a covered porch facing the water. Someone had left two white shells on the porch railing. A pair of rocking chairs sat to the right of the door. Jeremy hadn't smiled yet that day, but he did then. Their closest neighbor was the Pacific Ocean. He would be living on the edge of the world. The porch door opened and Becker appeared. He was a skinny, handsome man in his mid-thirties with the same Irish pale coloring as Jeremy and his father, as well as the same wavy brown hair. Big brother, Becker hollered, leaping the railing as they got out of the car. Baby nephew. Hey, Bex, called Jeremy's dad. Jeremy fixed his hair while the brothers hugged and punched each other then had it messed up again as Becker pounced on him. Look at this kid! Becker pulled Jeremy into a one-armed hug, pressing a fist against his ribs. Not a baby now! Tall like his uncle, freckles like his mom. Guess who's going to break the heart of every girl in Rosemont? You know life doesn't start until you have a girlfriend. Jeremy pinched out a smile, earning a barked laugh and a slap on the stomach. His dad was already on the porch, heading inside with the first of their bags, and Becker's hand rose to squeeze Jeremy's shoulder as he disappeared. Okay, but how's the old man doing? He asked, pitching his voice low. I know things were officially final a couple weeks ago, but man, today, this has got to, this has really got to make it real for Mike. Jeremy fought the urge to duck out from under his uncle's arm and run for the house. It had been three whole years since he'd seen Becker, and he'd forgotten how quickly he could leap from noisy joking to buddy-buddy affection. It all made Jeremy nervous. Dad's been kind of quiet, Jeremy managed. I think he's, um, thinking or something. It was honestly, as much as he knew. Got it, Becker said. Guess it can be hard to say what you're really feeling, especially when it's something big like this. Well, I'm going to do what I can to get his spirits up. His fingers dug into Jeremy's neck. 
and you gotta work with me, okay, bud? Your dad needs both of us in his corner right now. Jer! Jeremy looked up in time to miss catching an airborne house key. It bounced into the sandy dirt. You've got the room upstairs, his dad called from the porch. Get your stuff in. Becker gave him a conspiratorial wink and let him go. Jeremy, relieved, retrieved the key, grabbed the first of his bags, and headed inside. And this has been a preview of the language of seabirds.